Good morning, dear students. So we have come to the last lecture for modern geometry for this semester. And for this morning, we shall talk about contributions of some mathematicians in the development of this non-Euclidean geometry called hyperbolic geometry. So your non-Euclidean geometry was born out of early mathematicians' efforts to prove the parallel postulate. These are the main players in the development of non-Euclidean geometry, particularly hyperbolic geometry. Who is Carl Friedrich Gauss? He is known for his works in number theory. So he's not only known for geometry, but also for number theory. He is not the dominant mathematician in the early part of the 19th century, and he took over Euler and Lagrange. He made huge contributions in many different areas of mathematics. And as a teenager, he studied about the parallel postulate of Euclid. He knew that there was a non-Euclidean geometry before anybody else. And there are proofs to this. He was convinced that we can deny the fifth postulate, although he was hesitant to publish his works on parallel lines. Now, Gauss never actually published what he found, possibly out of fear of ridicule, because the elements of Euclid then was like a Bible. It was accepted by everyone, so he does not want to go against, because that's the status quo. He was a perfectionist, and he kept the information to himself. What about Nikolai Ivanovich? Lobachevsky. He was in Russia. He worked independently on parallels and came out with an extensive findings on geometry devoid of the fifth postulate. So he worked completely independent from Gauss, from Bolyai, and the rest, and had been working along similar lines with uh, Janusz Bolyai to develop a geometry in which the fifth postulate is not applicable. Now, this geometry is now called the bolyai Lobachevsky, so that's giving credit to Bolyai and Lobachevsky. Although Gauss claimed to have originated the idea, but the problem is it was not published. He did not publish his findings. Next, Farkas Bolyai. Now, Farkas Bolyai had been a student of Carl Friedrich Gauss, and he also worked extensively on the proof of the fifth postulate or the parallel axiom of Euclid, but did not prosper or did not succeed. Now, by the way, he, uh, Farkas Bolyai requested Gauss to accept his son in his school, but uh, Gauss denied. So in one of his letters to his son, Farkas Bolyai wrote, You must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to the very end. I have traversed this bottomless night, which extinguished all light and joy in my life. I entreat you, leave the science of parallels alone. Learn from my example. So he wrote this letter to his son to stop him from studying parallel lines because he was not successful in proving the fifth postulate. However, that did not deter his son to pursue his quest on proving the fifth postulate. And so Janos Bolyai persisted his quest and eventually concluded that in fact there's a geometry that is independent of the parallel postulate. In 1832, he published a brilliant 24-page paper that eventually shook the foundation of the 2,000-year-old tradition of Euclidean geometry. Next, we have Eugenio Beltrami, an Italian geometer, who also decided to investigate the Lobachevsky's work and to place it, if possible, within the context of differential geometry as redefined by Gauss. So he therefore moved independently in the direction already taken by Bernard Riemann. Uh, Beltrami investigated the surface of constant negative curvature and found that on such a surface, triangles obeyed the formulas of hyperbolic trigonometry that uh, Lobachevsky had discovered were appropriate to his form of non-Euclidean geometry. And so 
Beltrami gave the first rigorous description of a geometry other than Euclid's. Beltrami's account of the surface of a constant negative curvature was ingenious. He said it was an abstract surface that he could describe by drawing maps much as one might describe a sphere by means of the pages of a geographic atlas. He did not claim to have constructed the surface embedded in the Euclidean two-dimensional space. Now, in 1868, he described the surface as a pseudosphere. pseudosphere. So, it has constant negative curvature. However, the pseudosphere is not a complete model for hyperbolic geometry because intrinsically, straight lines on the pseudosphere may intersect themselves and cannot be continued past the bounding circle. Now, let's look at hyperbolic geometry and the different models, particularly that which was developed by Beltrami uh, uh, point carré. So let's look at hyperbolic geometry using a model made by Italian geometer Eugenio Beltrami. Now to understand his model, we have to get back to the sphere. Okay, so this is the sphere. And the equation of the sphere is x squared. Sorry, please make the necessary corrections. This is supposed to be x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to k. So let's generalize the sphere. This is the equation of the sphere. x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to k. Now Beltrami realized that to get to hyperbolic geometry, we just have to modify this equation. Okay, Modify the equation of a sphere. Instead of plus z squared, we shall make it minus z squared, okay? So, x squared, x squared, plus y squared, minus z squared is equal to k. So, to go from spherical to hyperbolic geometry, we simply replace the sign of z squared from positive to negative. We have x squared plus y squared minus z squared is equal to now, how does it look like? How does the graph of this look like? Okay, so x squared plus y squared minus z squared is equal to k. Now, how does it look like? How does the graph of this look like? Let's uh, begin with k equal to 0. Okay. How does it look when k is equal to 0? So, let's start by drawing our x, y, z plane. So, when k is equal to 0, then we shall have okay, a cone. Okay. So this is when k is equal to 0. What happens when k is equal to 1? When k is equal to 1. If k is equal to 1, then we shall have a hyperboloid. We get a hyperboloid and it looks like this. So here we have okay, the hyperboloid. Now to help you visualize a hyperboloid, now let's draw two planes, one on top of the other. Now let's draw a circle on this plane. And we shall connect corresponding points of the circle with a string. And here we shall have a cylinder. Okay, here we get a cylinder. What happens if we twist or rotate the upper circle? Now if we try to rotate the upper circle, then we'll end up with something like this. Okay, something like this. So somewhat like your... Okay, hyperboloid. So that's one way by which you could visualize your hyperboloid. This is when k is equal to 1. How about when k is equal to negative 1? So let's label. This is for k equal to 1. What about when k is equal to negative 1? When k is equal to negative 1, it is also a hyperboloid. It's also a hyperboloid of revolution but in here, there are two branches, okay? So that's the, there are two separate parts, okay? This is when k is equal to negative 1, when k is equal to negative 1. And according to Beltrami, 
it's when k is equal to negative 1 it's uh, most suited to the uh, outcome of the investigation of gauss of uh, lobachevsky and bolyai and so beltrami focused on k equal to negative one. Um, the hyperbolic plane is this. According to him, this is the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so this is the hyperbolic plane according to Beltrami. He found out that everything or anything that you can do on the sphere could be done also on the hyperbolic plane. So the next question is, what's a line? The next question is, What's a line on the hyperbolic plane? So just like on the sphere, a plane must cut through the hyperbolic plane through the center. So the line would kind of look like a parabola. It's really quite difficult to picture it out. So to help us visualize this world, let's imagine. At this point, it's really very difficult to visualize this world. So at this point, we put our eyes on the center and we try to project it onto a plane I mean upper looking at the upper hyperboloid we try to project it on the plane such that the plane touches the bottom of the hyperboloid so if we look at it from this perspective from here if we are at the bottom and we look up, what would be seen above will just be a circle. Or a cone. And lines here will simply be just like the lines in Euclidean geometry, straight lines. So, This is what we call the Beltrami Klein model. Okay, this is the Beltrami Klein model. May I erase this now? Now we can view this from another perspective. Now, for instance, we put our eyes down here. We put our eyes down here and we look up. This time, we project the hyperboloid about the plane through here. Okay, so what can we see above will still be a circle or a disk. So we shall have another disk here. We'll see a disk. But this time, the great circles in the original hyperboloid looks like circular arcs on this disk. And this is the Beltrami Poincare model. And the circular arcs are actually perpendicular to the boundary. Now let's, let's look at these two models in a two-dimensional viewpoint. Starting off with Let's look at those two models in a two-dimensional viewpoint, beginning with the Beltrami Poincare model. So 
So, going back to our drawing a while ago, from here, this is the disc, and these are circular arcs on the disc, and these are the great circles. So, in the Beltrami Poincare model, this is the boundary. The great circles on the original hyperboloid are now circular arcs, but not just circular arcs, but such that this should be perpendicular to the boundary. So, this is one line on the Beltrami Poincare disk. Here is another line, okay, so perpendicular to the boundary. Here is another line okay so these are lines in the beltrami poincare model and we can also see here a triangle this is also a triangle on the disc this is a triangle now what's interesting about this model is that the angles are just like the angles in your euclidean geometry and the angles could be measured using an ordinary protractor so we can measure this angle this angle and this angle by using a protractor and uh, from our previous uh, lecture we said that for hyperbolic geometry the sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees so the sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees and in fact the sum of the angles sum of the angles is equal to 180 degrees minus the area of this triangle okay so this is in hyperbolic geometry but please take note that in spherical geometry in spherical geometry the sum of the angles is equal to 180 plus the area of the triangle we said before that for spherical geometry the sum of the angles is always greater than 180 degrees. Okay, now the next question is, how about distance between two points? Okay, how do we measure separation between two points? Okay, what's the distance between two points on the disk or on this model? Suppose that, let's magnify. Okay, suppose you are, uh, should I say you started from this point and moved somewhere here a little farther. And then after quite some time, again, you move a certain distance away. And then again, farther, farther away. Then again, closer, move further, but closer to the boundary. Okay, can you tell me exactly the distance from your starting point to where you are? Now, suppose you continue moving and moving and moving towards the boundary. Will you ever reach the boundary? Will there come, will there come a time when you reach the boundary? The well, answer is no way. Okay? You can never get to the boundary. Take note that as you move farther and farther from your starting point, your image gets smaller and smaller. Okay, as you get closer and closer to the boundary but you'll never get there you'll never get to the boundary because remember that the hyperboloid extends infinitely upward so let's go back to our illustration a while ago look at this okay projection lang natin yan pero ito this one extends infinitely upward so like it casts a shadow on the plane if it casts a shadow here it will be just circular However, these are not the end, okay? We call it boundary, but in fact, this is just the limit because this could be extended infinitely. Your hyperboloid extends infinitely upward. So let's go back, okay? So no matter how far you go, you'll never reach the boundary because there is endless space beyond this point, okay? Next. Next. We have the next model, which is the Beltrami-Klein model, which is a lot simpler. Because in the Beltrami-Klein model, lines are simply uh, similar to the lines that we have in Euclidean geometry. However, however, the difference is the line will never intersect the boundary. Okay, 
the line will never intersect the boundary. So this is one line, here is another line, okay, here is a, another line. And then bounded by the three lines is a triangle. So also the triangle looks like the triangle in your Euclidean geometry. So it's simpler. So this is a simpler view of our Beltrami Klein model and the Beltrami Poincaré model. Now we proceed to comparing and contrasting between K okay, hyperbolic Euclidean and spherical space. So the next part is comparing and contrasting between and among Euclidean, hyperbolic, and the uh, spherical geometry. So Euclidean space are flat, okay, planes are flat, zero curvature. Spherical surface has a positive curvature, and for hyperbolic, the surface has a negative curvature. But what do we mean by curvature? What do we mean by a positive curvature and a negative curvature? In a sphere, the curvature is positive because no matter where you move, okay, from one point to another point on the sphere, it curves the same way in every direction, and so it is positive. However, for hyperbolic, it's negative because the movement is different depending on your direction. Just like the saddle, okay, there is one point in which you go down and then later at one point you'll move up, okay? So the negative, that's the reason behind the negative curvature. An example of a negative curvature, yung inyong uh, piatos or yung eto. Yung parang saddle nga. Ganyan. Okay? Move from here, you move down and then up. And then here, move up and then down. Okay? Negative. Now, what about a line? Once more, although I drew this a while ago na, it's just uh, to emphasize, an arc of a circle that is orthogonal. What do we mean by orthogonal? It's uh, perpendicular, okay, to the circumference of the disk. Circumference, this one. That one which is in, in uh, red. But don't say this is the end. No, because it's boundless. This is the circumference at infinity. Okay? So orthogonal or perpendicular. That which creates right angle. So this is how a line is defined in hyperbolic geometry. Next. Euclid's second postulate, does it hold in hyperbolic geometry? Yes. Any straight line segment can be extended indefinitely in a straight line. In like manner, in hyperbolic geometry, it could be extended infinitely. Okay, but however, the difference is, ito straight line, ito curve. Okay, curve. Next, the hyperbolic axiom or the parallel postulate. Parallel postulate in the hyperbolic geometry states that there exists a line and a point not on the line such that there are at least two, at least two lines passing through this point parallel to the line. So my line L, this is the given line, and the given point is P. Okay, take note that there are several lines parallel to L that passes through or containing point P. We have line 1. We have line 2 and we have line 3. So that's the hyperbol hyperbolic axiom. At least two. Okay, two or more lines passing through P is parallel to the given line. How about lines in hyperbolic geometry? Now, a hyperbolic line is not the same thing as a Euclidean line. So for example, hyperbolic lines are curves. They do, however, share some... Um, similar properties. So the following is a list of uh, these properties. These are the similarities between hyperbolic line and Euclidean line. In Euclidean geometry, there is one and only one shortest path between any two points, and we call this the shortest path, the straight path. And this path lies along the line segment joining the two points. Exactly the same statement is true in hyperbolic points and hyperbolic lines. Next, in Euclidean geometry, two points determine a unique line. Uh, in other words, given any two points, there exists a line that passes through those two points. Additionally, there, 
does not exist any other line that will pass through both of those two points. Exactly the same statement is true in hyperbolic geometry. So these properties of lines in Euclidean geometry are true to hyperbolic lines. Now, in spite of these similarities, hyperbolic lines have many different properties from Euclidean lines. So for example, these geometric theorems are false. They false in hyperbolic geometry. In Euclidean geometry, if two lines are parallel to a third line, then the two lines are parallel to each other. So not necessary because looking at the, our illustration a while ago, looking at this, so line L is parallel to line 1 and is also parallel to line 2. However, line 1 and line 2 are not parallel but intersecting. Okay, so let's go back to that. So it does not hold. This is not true. Okay, this is a false theorem in hyperbolic geometry. Next, in Euclidean geometry, if two lines are parallel, then the two lines are equidistant. Again, you can, well, let's go back to that illustration. L and L1 are parallel. L and L1 are parallel, but they are not equidistant. So this one is also false. And thirdly, in Euclidean geometry, lines that do not have an end also do not have a boundary. Yeah. Lines do not have an end also do not have a boundary or a point that they are headed toward yet never reaches. So these are false in hyperbolic geometry. Now we explore more about triangles in hyperbolic geometry. A triangle. So let this be three points on the circumference. Okay three points on the boundary such that these three points will determine triangle. This is an example of an ideal triangle. It's an ideal triangle. So the three vertices, okay, the three vertices lie on the circle at infinity. The vertices are at the, or on rather, the circle at infinity. Ideal triangles are sometimes called triply asymptotic triangles, triple asymptotic triangles or trebly asymptotic triangles. And the vertices are also called ideal vertices. And all ideal triangles are congruent. Okay, so what is an ideal triangle? This is an ideal triangle. So the vertices are points on the circle at infinity. The vertices are points on the circle at infinity. What are some of the properties? Okay, so this is how the ideal triangle uh, looks like in the two models that we have discussed earlier on point caress. It will be the ideal triangle would look like this, but on the Klein's model, it would look like your plane uh, your Euclidean geometry, so the triangle would look like this. Okay, some of the properties of the ideal triangles are the following, like what I said earlier, congruent to each other. All ideal triangles are congruent to each other. The interior angles of an ideal triangle are all zero. Okay, all zero, but because take note that these lines or the sides of the triangle Okay, the sides of the triangle are arcs that actually do not meet. Okay, never will they meet each other. Okay, they will never meet. And therefore, the interior angles of an ideal triangle are all zero. An ideal triangle has infinite perimeter. An ideal triangle is the largest possible triangle in hyperbolic geometry. All vertices extend to infinity. That's why. Okay, the vertices extend to infinity, so it's not along this, remember this is limit, the boundary is a limit, okay, which means this could be extended infinitely here, okay, there is no end to it, so it's infinite, all vertices extend to infinity and the sides will never meet, that explains the second the sides will never meet and therefore the interior angles of an ideal triangle are all zero. Next, okay, another comparison, comparing and contrasting between the three um, different types of geometry, spherical, Euclidean, and hyperbolic. In terms of circumference of a circle, 
in spherical geometry, the circumference is equal to 2 pi sine r. r refers to the radius of the sphere. Okay. In Euclidean geometry, it's simply 2 pi r. But for, for, uh, for hyperbolic geometry, we have the formula c equal to 2 pi hyperbolic sine times the radius of the hyperboloid. In terms of area of a circle, in spherical geometry, we have 2 pi times the quantity 1 minus cosine r. For Euclidean geometry, we have simply pi r squared. For hyperbolic geometry, we have a equal to 2 pi r cosine, or hi, sorry, hyper cosine. This one is hyper sine, okay? Hyperbolic sine. This is hyperbolic sine. This is hyperbolic cosine of r minus 1. Finally, the Pythagorean theorem also varies, okay, on the three types of geometry. For spherical geometry, we have cosine of a times cosine of b is equal to cosine of c. For Euclidean geometry, we have a squared plus b squared equal to c squared. For hyperbolic geometry, we have hyperbolic cosine of a times hyperbolic cosine of b is equal to the hyperbolic cosine of c. So, referring to the sides of the triangle. In terms of area of a triangle, okay, I think I made mention about this a while ago. You can do formula transformation for spherical geometry. It's area area of a triangle is simply sum b angles minus pi and for hyperbolic geometry area is equal to pi or 180 degrees minus sum of the angles so i think this is the last slide that's it this is all for um, this morning thank you very much